It's Jim White, Sam and Jordan, and we are live on this sunny morning on Talk Sport. 100% engagement. Jim White and Simon Jordan on Talk Sport. Oh, Simon, what a beautiful morning. Look out that window. What do you see? What's, what's, what's that got to do with the price of cheese, Jim? <laughs> Honestly, quite out loud. I don't care. I couldn't care less about the weather. Right? I'm very perturbed this morning. Right? I've heard right, there's this absolute Herbert called Adam Diggle. Right? He <laughs> purports to be an impressionist who can do a passable impression of me. Right? And out comes, right? Out comes you morons have let him in the building. <laughs> Okay, well, Simon, Nonsense. you've got us off to a flyer of a start. Always, um, always, never fail. <laughs> Adam, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Mate, fantastic. Well, go on, Simon. That's not bad, It's like it? looking in the mirror. <laughs> Separated yeah, well, at birth. Yeah, a bit younger, though, aren't I? Yeah, well, yeah. Okay, not wearing well, though. <laughs> Everybody no, this hair, I don't even have that hair colour anymore. Oh, I, I'm just holding up a mirror. If you don't like the reflection, that's <laughs> your problem, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> what? Everybody uh, listening in this morning, and there are many, Adam, uh, you are welcome. This is oh, not Simon you. Jordan. Simon Jordan is sitting to my right. Indeed. The real Simon Jordan, of course. Adam Diggle, uh, yes. impressionist from Manchester, voice actor. Yes. Right. So this is what you do. Yeah, yeah. I mainly do video games and cartoons and stuff, and impressions is a little bit of a, a side hustle, I, I guess. That, yeah, Brilliant. That pursuing. When, when did you decide, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to have a go at Simon Jordan. I'm going to I'm gonna do him. I remember the day, actually, well, my friend and I, Tom, who's joined me here. Right? So, we, <laughs> Tom, we, good morning. Hello, Tom, yeah, yeah. Good, good man, good man. All right, so um, we, were, um, we were at a cricket match, and I'd, I'd followed Simon really through boxing, because yep. I know nothing about football, which you know, might, some people might say is accurate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It makes my impression better, not worse. <laughs> um, um, and Tom was like, have you thought about doing Simon? And I was like, oh, no, no. I mean, is he famous enough, really? <laughs> no. Well, I got a fraction. No, uh, no. I was like, I'll give it a go. And um, and I did not expect that video to go. I mean, thank you, you both shared it. I thought it was funny. Oh, I thought it was very thank good. I, I wanted to say Darren Farley eat Adam's dust. Um, right? Don't get by comparison. Well, well. But no, I thought it was very funny. There's nothing more flattering, is there? If someone takes the Mickey out well, of you and, you, and imitates you, it's flattering. Definitely. You're you're right, Simon, because others have tried uh, and failed at him, and and you seem to have nailed it. <laughs> and I noticed you got me with this very strong Scottish <laughs> accent. Go on, have a have a till. Oh my Jim. I, I, I'm a bit hit and miss, to be honest. <laughs> Simon, you're not happy. <laughs> That's a bit Ian Paisley. It is, gets a little bit, doesn't it? You do drift. It does drift because you're quite nasal in your voice. It does kind of drift into potential. But what was funny about there. it is when I'm, I'm you're, you're taking the mickey out of me doing a rant and then Jim comes in with a poor sod that has, hasn't had a word in. You're, for God's <laughs> sakes, let God Simon speak. <laughs> let, him, let him finish. <laughs> Go on, Simon. <laughs> you see what's happened here? Adam's in the studio and you're impersonating me. <laughs> Oh, oh God, wrong! Good. Good. <laughs> What's going wrong? Uh, how long did it take to master S Mr. Simon Jordan? It, I want to say it took months, but it, it didn't actually. I mean, I don't say I've, I've, I've never. I never say that I've mastered an impression. Good, it's always. Yeah, there you go. Uh, right, it's right, calm down. Right, <laughs> pull, pull up your big boy pants. <laughs> take it on my chin. Right, uh, <laughs> He's got the phrase. He's even got he? a pink shirt on today. I, know, like, I, I came in. I was I like, got the memo. How's this, memo, how's this little sod got the same shirt on as me? What, what of his phrases? What, which ones do you really like? I don't know. In my, my my favorite is I don't have a dog in this particular fight. Right. Well, they, they, but, couldn't find, they couldn't find their backsides above hands in a funnel. That's why. I'm, <laughs> that's a good one. Notwithstand, that not, not, that's a good one. Yes. Not, notwithstanding that, I get so much scope to say it because I'm dealing with so many people that can't. That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> so you're on the so, same level here. Who else? Who else do you do? You're in the boxing world. Yeah. You do some of them. Well, I, know, I think you've got Chris Eubanks Senior coming on later, I believe. Yes. <laughs> and I, I, I do a bit of Nigel Ben as well. So if you leave my son alone, all right? Simon, you've never put on a, on a pair of boxing gloves in your life, son. You know nothing. You you talk, talk but you've never walked the walk. I leave him alone. <laughs> Told you he was good. <laughs> I love it. I think this has opened up... Um, an enormous opportunity for you, Adam, oh, because to be honest, the list could be endless now that you've started. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, like I said, I'm just flabbergasted that it's taken off as much as it has. It's come, I'm, a, I'm a little bit in shock. To no, be brilliant, brilliant. Well, you're sitting with us this morning, and we are very fortunate to have a million plus listeners. Yeah. Uh, and I'm looking at the messages that are coming in, and they're loving it. Yeah, at last, someone 
who is now close to Simon Jordan because in the past yeah I totally get that in the past no one's managed to nail you Simon and now Adam has got it it's not difficult really because he comes away with the most ridiculous phrases on a regular <laughs> basis it is manner from heaven the amount of catchphrases that you've got because they're a really good way into an impression like do- dollars for donuts and all that jazz once you they're a good way to kind of go and then you're in and, and then you've you're got in. so many. There's just too many to choose from. Yeah. So yeah I'm just... happy to be helpful. <laughs> Here to amuse. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know what you're doing, though, because you know <laughs> that these phrases Not that you, you use, people out there use them now. No, I don't. You just punctuate sentence with something that can concentrate people's minds. That's all I'm right. trying to do. It draw, draw it, people into yeah, a conclusion right. yeah. or the direction that I want to take them in. And if they haven't, got, got, the ca- and if they haven't got the vocabulary to keep up, that's their problem. Oh, that's right. Oh, then you get Russell Brandon, who's got an even bigger vocabulary. Oh, my gosh. How did you cope with that? Oh, Russell's very good. Yeah, he was very good. He was in here last week, Adam. He, he was excellent. So, Adam, now that you've started it, there'll be no no end to it. Come back when we've got more Simon Jordan phrases to play about with, and you're more than welcome <laughs> in this studio, to. mate. I'd love Finish to. Finish off with a bit of Simon before we go to the break. Come on. Well, I'll tell you what. I've met you in person, and I thought you'd be a bit of a more one, to be honest. But... I'm in the invidious position of having to bet off maybe wrong about you, Simon. So thank you for that. And my no, eyes are opened. <laughs> Adam, Very <you're>, good. <laughs> no, Adam, you're absolutely right. When you look at it, Stuart, yesterday, they lose to Arsenal. And they lose in what was a late, late show. Mm-hmm. But then you look at their Premier League record away to the big six, under 10 hag. They lost 6-3 to Manchester City. They, lo- they drew 1-1 at Chelsea. They lost 3-2 at Arsenal they lost 7-0 of course they did at Liverpool they lost 2-0 at Spurs the list goes on this is last season they lost 3-1 at Arsenal yesterday what what is it telling us that away from home they can't do it against the big boys no wins in seven well what it's telling us is Manchester United are not the Manchester United of Alex Ferguson era that is for sure they're not the biggest powerhouse around at the moment there's two three maybe even four teams that, that are potentially stronger than them and the most Worrying thing for me, if I, if I was United, the other two games that they've played that they've won this year, Wolverhampton at home, which they shouldn't have done. If Wolves had a striker, they could have won that 2-3-0 comfortably. If the referee would have given a late penalty, that the game's a draw. And the Forest game, Forest 2-0 up in, in six minutes or so. So the, the alarm bells are there for about where United are actually going to finish in, in the division this year. Where do you think they'll finish? It's impossible to to say with any degree of accuracy. They will be... Well, I think even with four games under their belt, I don't think you're seeing them in the top two. That is for sure. Um, And you're aiming for Champions League if you're them. Yeah. And and that would be a, a successful season. I mean, the stats show, Simon, they can't do it against the big guns away from home. They don't win against the big guys. <clears throat> well, I mean, the two teams that we that we considered to be better than Man United last season were obviously the two teams that were better than them, which was Man City and Arsenal. So I'm not entirely sure why we'd be surprised that Manchester United got beaten by those sides. The fact they got beaten away by Liverpool and the fact they got beaten away by Tottenham, OK, fine, but they finished above them in the league. So in the great scheme of things, whilst these whilst these are interesting statistics for us, it was, you know, two years ago we were talking about this un- wonderful unbeaten away record that they had with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, but it brought them the, the square root of bugger all. And so with that in mind, do we believe that Ten Hag has the ability to get this side closer to these sides at the top? Because I don't think anyone, any sensible observer, even the most obtuse of Manchester United fans, believe that they're at a stage where they're even going to get close to overtaking Man City. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about Manchester United finishing third again? Um, and is that awful? Well, it is awful in terms of what you expect Manchester United to be. Mm. But this is now cyclical. They don't have their own way. They don't have the issues. The, gla- the people going on endlessly about the Glazers and how much the Glazers do and don't affect it. I listened to Gary Neville whilst talking about the offside lines yesterday being drawn, suggesting that in some shape or form, that was because of the Glazers. And the reasons why there's this vacuum inside the football club and the reasons why these outcomes are manifesting themselves as they are is because of the Glazers. No. It's because the players aren't performing at the level they should be. The management isn't doing its job and the recruitment policies are wrong. We're hearing people like Jaden Sancho coming out and talking about issues. Well, I wouldn't mind Jaden Sancho talking if he had a body of work to support any sort of pushback. He hasn't got a body of work. He's been poor since he stepped through the door. There might be reasons behind that. So you've got a whole culture... Do you think Ten Hag's an elite manager? Um, well, it depends what you think elite is. I mean, there's... Uh, for well, me, you tell me. Well, I think elite... The, the term elite like world class is thrown around like confetti 
too often too easily. Elite means that you're one of a kind. You achieve something no one else can achieve. We consider elite to be people get in the top four. There's only really significant people that win the leagues. Those are the elite guys. And you've got the next echelon of managers that probably Ten Hag falls into that bracket. Of. Is he best in class? For Manchester United? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think he's a very capable and a very good manager. But I don't think he's best in class. Best in class sits in the other dugout across the city. I think best in class is Jurgen Klopp. Um, and albeit his performances in recent terms haven't dictated that, Chelsea haven't got best in class. Chelsea have got the best of the also rents, which is Pochettino. Comes in, build your decent side, get you close, get you a whiff of success, but won't actually deliver you an outcome. But if the record, if this was a record away from home against the big boys, say this was Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's record, you'd be absolutely hammering into him this morning. Um, in the same way that I've made observations about Ten Hag. I made observations about the, the, his whole disposition last year and it got turned into some ridiculous parody of the observation that I said, which was his suit didn't fit him. My actual position was he doesn't look like a man that's pushing his chest out and doesn't look like a man that's strong in his position. Now, we can see that he's strong because he makes observations, he makes statements, he makes declarations, he seems to uh, have, have a view on the world, albeit the, the, the observations from those around the football world say, well... Why don't his wingers do their job? Why do they think they have a choice? Why do his wingers think they can do different things than perhaps Man City, Man City wingers think they can do? Well, he makes observations, Simon, and one of those was that he insisted that a wrong angle was viewed when Ganacho's late effort was disallowed for offside. I'm afraid, Eric, we've been on the PGMOL this morning who've come back to tell us, for the Premier League, yesterday, five cameras are calibrated the main wide camera, both 18-yard box cameras and both goal line cameras. In other words, Stuart, they're all up and running. Of mm -hmm. course they are. Hawkeye can also use any broadcast camera to identify the point of contact with the ball by the attacker and synchronises all cameras for this purpose. All cameras. The broadcast cameras operate with 50 frames per second. So the point of contact with the ball is one of those frames inside the 50 offside. per second. So in other words, offside is damn well offside. Mm. And Eric Ten Hag saying the wrong angle was viewed. Sorry, Eric. You don't know what they're using. The, the You've one, no idea what they're using. The one thing you know where there is clarity, we, we can sit here on a Monday morning and, and bemoan certain decisions, but near enough an exact science is the offside law. For me. Yeah. So I don't think you can overly criticise that. Exactly. It's a fairly straightforward sequence of events, Simon. But it's never been more precise than it is now. Yeah, I mean, I think that was the default setting of a disappointed manager. Um, and it's a default setting of every manager when they're disappointed. And some, sometimes I think that's excusable because you're being asked to comment on something directly after the game so your emotions will run the better of you. The other time I think about it is ultimately these things are things that you have to overcome and these are challenges that you have to be able to surpass. So I listened to what he said about the penalty. I didn't think it was a penalty. I didn't think it was, I thought it was offside, and I didn't think Johnny Evans was impeded. So I think all of those things were just the the, the, the disappointment yeah. of, a, of a manager that went from looking like he was going to win a game, and the whole conversation this morning, completely different conversation. We're all jumping on the Arsenal bandwagon, but there was that's the margins of top-end sports. If United had scored that goal and, and gone on to win the game 2-1, we'd be having a completely different conversation. So there wasn't that much difference between Arsenal and Manchester United. OK, Arsenal, Manchester United's performance was more atypical of an away side rather than a dominant... Mm. Um, but the scoreline is the scoreline. The scoreline is the scoreline. And I think the scoreline probably flatters the outcome to some extent. And the record's a record. And the record is a record. He can't beat the big boys away from home. But he finished third in the table. So irrespective of whether he can beat the big boys at home, some of those big boys finished beneath him in the league. So the question is, is... Can United bridge the gap between Arsenal and Man City to win the league? The answer is no. Will Man United finish in the top four? I would suspect so. Mm. Is that what we, in our minds, are? This idea that Manchester United now have some preordained, God-given right to be the champions of England, that's gone. That's gone. United are not... <clears throat> Ferguson is a thing of the past. <clears throat> You know, this Manchester United, again, to, re to quote something I used previously, is like the Monty Parrot Python skit about, skit about the parrot. It's no longer the same parrot. It's a dead parrot. Right. Ferguson is no longer there. Yeah. You know, and now you've got a whole new direction and you've got some very significant competitors that can match you on spending. So you've got to be better in every other department. And United, across the board, from their recruitment policy through to the manager and his coaching staff, 
aren't doing enough. That's why you hear rumblings like players talking out. That's why you hear Ten Hag operating in a certain way. That's why their recruitment policies are being criticised and critiqued, because it isn't the best in class. Martin, I think this is one tailor made for Simon. So many people getting in touch this morning. Uh, and I'll just take one at random. There's Brett. Surely, 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 Chelsea in breach of FFP. What are they doing? This cannot be right. Chelsea have now broken the British transfer record twice in the space of a few months. And the Caicedo deal, if it goes through, Martin, will take them to more than £800 million spent in just over a year under the new Todd Bowley ownership. So Chelsea will now have paid Brighton, incidentally, almost £200 million on player and managerial signings. Mm. I mean, when it boils down to it, Simon, explain this to us. I mean, has Bowley been more disruptive to the Premier League landscape than the likes of Abramovich ever was? Well... You have to look and see what he's doing because no one's bought a football club for two and a half billion quid. So Bramwich bought it off Ken Bates 20-odd years ago and paid a certain amount of money and then went on a spending spree. And if you if you price in inflation, it's comparable to what um, Todd Bowley's doing. Um, I don't like it. I think it is prolific and profligate. But you also have to look at what he's actually doing. He believes, I think, that there's, a, that there's much more revenue around in the football world than is currently being achieved, whether it's digitally or a variety of different opportunities that Chelsea believe they're going to build. But here's what's happening with their transfer spend. And here's what's happening with their ability to be able to adhere. I think it, they'll struggle to do it in a longer game if they don't start getting some achievements on the pitch. But here's what they, where they really are. They've spent £800 million on players. They spent £600 million last year. They capitalised that over eight years. All those players were on eight-year contracts. So all of a sudden, that £600 million spend is reducing at £75 million a year. So you're charging £75 million because you're dividing £600 by eight. Right? You're reducing your £600 million spend mm -hmm. by £75 million every year. He's now had that change because they didn't like it. The football fraternity went, you can't do that over eight years. We only want it back to five. So this year's spend right, will be £300 million, around about that. And right. we'll be reducing at £60 million a year. So he's now losing £75 million each year from the spend last year, mm -hmm. plus plus sixty this year. But he's gone and sold... 250 million worth of players in three transfer windows. And all of those players have, 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 have produced an outcome that have been profitable to Chelsea. He sold Kai, he sold Kai Havertz for 60-odd million quid. He bought him for 60-odd million quid. But on his balance sheet at the time, when he sold Kai Havertz, he was carrying him at 25 million. So he sold him for 60, he's booked a 35 million pound profit. He sold Mason Mount, who's an academy player, for 60 million quid. Mm. He's booked a 60 million pound profit. So over the three windows, he's booked somewhere in the region of 200 million worth of transfer gains on his balance sheet, and he's, and he's reducing it by 135 every year. So he's 65 million pound in credit right now on his balance sheet against mm. transfers. That's how he's doing it. Now, eventually, if Chelsea don't pull up revenue and start to get back in the Champions League or ge generate other revenue streams, this is going to catch up with him sooner rather than later. But right now, £800 million worth of spend it equates to £135 million a year worth of transfer losses right. or depreciation. And then you've got £200 million worth of transfer gains on Havertz, on Mason Mount on uh, Ruben Loftus-Cheek, yeah. and on and on we go. Look look who they've sold. But it's right. a gamble in the longer term. Well, If it, they don't start doing it it's a gamble, on the pitch. It's a gamble in terms of the consequence around financial fair play. Now, let's look at what the consequence is. The consequence in financial fair play is a financial consequence, right? Are we suggesting that people that have paid two and a half billion pounds for a business that are, that are funding 800 million pounds of transfers won't take a smack on the, on the, on the uh, knuckles like other clubs are getting right now, 10 million here, 20 million pounds there. I'm not suggesting he's aiming for that, but right now people are saying, how the hell can you spend 800 million pounds on transfer fees and not be breaching financial fair play? Well, I've just told you. If you're, if you're depreciating that at 135 million pounds a year and you've just sold 250, 260 million pounds of players of a fee transfer windows, and most of those players, with the exception of Timo Werner, which was sold at break, break even, are get, booking you a profit, you've just covered the last 18 months worth of potential losses and going into next year as well. Now, in 18 months' time, if Chelsea are still spending at this level, are still carrying that level of depreciation, haven't balanced the books by selling more players, right. and haven't got themselves into the Champions League, then they're going to get caught. I'm with you. So answer me this. Mm. Could Sullivan and West Ham, <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, but I'll put it to you, go on something of a similar spending spree because 
in the longer terms, they'll have balanced the books well, do, with 105 well, for Declan uh, and maybe, did I yeah, say it, right 70 for Paqueta. Well, but, but, but here's the thing, right? What did, I, what did I tell you about Newcastle? I said to you, Newcastle can spend money and they can spend big money and they'll spend 120, 150 million. No, they won't. They've got no money. It's not a bottomless pit. They've gone in and spent another 150 million quid, Newcastle. They spent 150 to 200 million last year. Since they've walked through the door, the, um, the Saudis will have spent somewhere in the region of three or four hundred million quid, getting close to that, right? And no one's talking about the complications of, of Newcastle's financial fair play, and they've only just got into the Champions League for the first season. So they can do it, but of course it's again how they spend their money and how much profit they've got in players. Declan Rice is a straightforward hundred million to profit. So they've now got a player that was an academy player that's got no carrying value. The moment they sell him for hundred million pounds, they've booked a hundred million pounds profit on that transfer. Now, of course, other players that they've bought previously, they're carrying a legacy mm-hmm. of <clears throat> losses and also players that are depreciating. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah. Be, and this is why you know Bowley's made a horlicks of the of the on-field stuff right now in terms of the managers that he's chosen and the performance he got from the team last year. But the economics, this this guy doesn't spend. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not admiring it, by the way. I'm explaining it. This guy doesn't spend two and a half billion pounds on a football club and doesn't know the ramifications of the economic model that he's building. He may not know a football manager from you know a pound of sprouts, but he does know the economics mm. of business. Yeah. And that's why they're they're okay at Chelsea. They will be able to, unless they've carried huge losses in the last three years that right. haven't been qualified by COVID and things of that nature. Yeah. They're okay, Chelsea. Mm. So they're okay like like Everton were. As explained by Mr. Jordan, that's how Bully's doing it, Martin. Well, that's a brilliant explanation, I must admit, because I, I, I didn't realise, I obviously uh, knew about depreciation. Just tell me then, Simon, so I know f- financial fair play didn't exist at that uh, time when you were at Crystal Palace, yeah. but did you work the same sort of model in terms of depreciation of players? You well, know? Of course you do. It's, a sta- yeah. it's been a standard principle standard, for years, yeah. and that's how you value players. I think it's an unfair principle, because if you've got a player on your balance sheet, and he's and like Declan, like Declan Rice... On, on West Ham's balance sheet, he couldn't prop up their balance sheet economically because he was worth nothing mm-hmm. in terms of capitalization. Yeah. But in market prices, he's worth 100 million quid. And the mm-hmm. only time they could have ever capitalized that is when they sold him. Mm-hmm. And I often think that's a flawed perspective for football because it doesn't help football clubs look economically solvent. Yeah. And if they're going to be governed by depreciation, they need some help. And I think the football authorities, without boring people le- lecturing economics, should look at it differently. But and I also think it's preposterous. Mm-hmm. If you buy a building, um, and, and you own it for 10 years, you can write it down over 10 years. Mm. If you buy a player and you want to put him on a contract for eight years, that's your funeral economically, mm. mm-hmm. yeah. so you should be able to capitalise it. And yeah. because the, all the guys suddenly saw Bowley doing this, they all went, well, we're not having that. Eight-year contracts, you can depreciate over eight-year contracts. It means that the depreciation is less. Mm-hmm. We want you back to five. And mm-hmm. in fact, that's silly. Another one at Chelsea's just out the door, Martin. In the last few minutes, Kepa, the goalkeeper, Kepa Ariza Balaga, has just joined Real Madrid in a season-long loan deal. But Martin, you look at it, when it comes to players, Caicedo, 115 mil. Mm. Declan, 105. Enzo Maresca, uh, 106. Um, Endo Fernandez, that should be. Jude Bellingham, 88, rising to 115. W- what has happened to the premium midfielder market in recent months? Because these are ridiculous amounts of money that are, are being spent. Enzo Fernandez, 100, 106 plus. Caicedo, 115. Where is the sensible fee in all of this? Well, as Simon has just explained, if 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 we uh, if we think that they're ridiculous, but he's, even so, that's the market, and and if someone is prepared to pay that, there, then well, well and good. So uh, I, I think for, let, let's let's put Declan Rice in it. Declan Rice has been talked all over the summertime around about a hundred million pounds, and we're talking about this here for a supposedly defensive midfield player who might not score that many, number of goals. Yeah. But the more players now that come in in this, like around about 110, 115, 120. If I'm Declan Rice, I'll feel pretty comfortable about it now because I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not under severe pressure anymore. I, it's a wee bit like Trevor Francis arriving at, for the first million pound and Trevor was very concerned. He was very nervous about it, you know, because he was holding this million pounds. But once he got going, once he started to score a few goals and once then the market within not so long, as you've just mentioned there, Simon, uh, the million pounds became, uh, you know, uh, one and a half million pounds and mm. things like this here. And then suddenly Trevor's thinking, well, I'm fantastic value because <laughs> I've just scored in the European <laughs> Cup final. Yeah. So the point I'm saying to you is it's it's what you're having to pay for it. Are, are, are we... Uh, yes, we're sitting around here and we're, we're, we're amazed that we're spending, uh, that teams are, are, are buying, uh, let's say, defensive midfield players, essentially, for 100 million pounds. It's insane, isn't it? 
Here's another one that could be insane in terms of numbers involved. Neymar looks like Al Halal in Saudi Arabia have agreed a deal with Paris Saint Germain to sign Neymar. Mm. You can imagine some of the figures going on in that one. Uh, so, the, the, the kind of money that's coming his way. See, the dynamic on that is different. And this is where the concern factor comes in about Saudis. They're not paying big transfer fees. What they're doing is they're breaking the ecosystem of wages. Transfer fees have value. Yeah. Because you capitalise them. The moment you write someone out a transfer fee, they're on your balance sheet. You spend 100 million quid over here, you replace them with a 100 million pound asset. You start paying wages, they just go out the door. They're a drain on profit. Mm. The problem with the Saudi league is that they're prepared to pay players £600,000 a week, £700,000 a week, £800,000 a week. They're not worried about transfer fees. That's not, not, mm. We're not seeing the transfer fee market right now in Saudi. They're just paying sort of nominal fees, 10, mm. 15 million, 20 million here. But what they're doing is they're going, we'll pay £50 million a year for a footballer. And then all of a sudden, footballers start saying to English Premier League clubs, the Liga football clubs, Serie A football clubs, and whoever else that's in, in, in football, hang on a second, I'm underpaid over here. Mm. I can go over to Saudi and I can mm. get £600,000 mm. a week. Yeah. And that's the danger and the jeopardy that... that that is that results in the Saudi league. Yeah, and that's where the issue is. Good morning, guys. First of all, hello, and uh, yeah, good work, guys. Thank but you. Yeah, just, um, just so frustrated and angry about it. Um, with respect to Martin, he said it did these things happen. It doesn't happen to teams on the up and up, and it doesn't happen to teams who expect to be anywhere um, at the top of the Premier League as well. It's it's been coming. I've been telling fellow fans and other people who are into football, it's, it's been coming and the, the players just, I don't know, I'm just so angry about it. <laughs> and, and, Fred, and you're not happy with Fernandes, Phil? No, no. I've seen him stamp his feet before and that. Like when he's and not had a, a decision go his way. I've seen him stamp his feet. And it's, 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 it's yeah, I'm just speechless almost. And yeah, it's, um, I've been telling people it's coming and... And also, just to clip on the end of that, Liverpool should be embarrassed as well because where did that come from? <laughs> That's a point. It was, well, it was spectacular in every sense of the word. Phil, thank you for that. Alex, uh, another Manchester United fan. Alex, good morning to you. I mean, was it, is this just a blip or is it more deep-rooted as far as United are concerned? Gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for having me on. Fantastic show as always. Thanks, um, Alex. Yeah, I mean, the main thing I want to talk about is just the absolute disarray and state of our captaincy at the moment. Um, I'm sick and tired of watching Bruno Fernandes. Every single time he doesn't get the ball, he slips or he doesn't get a challenge his way. All he's doing is throwing his hands up in the air, having a go at the ref and not doing his bloody job. <laughs> you know, Manchester United fans, we've been in a great place. We're going places. But if anyone could not see this coming, then you're completely deluded. Yeah. We have no leadership on that pitch. Yes, we're starting to play in a different way. We've got a proper manager and he's getting something out of the players. But we need to have a good look, a good hard look at ourselves and say, who's the leader on this pitch? But Alex, you need to have a good hard look at yourselves because did you lot not hound out your previous captain, Harry Maguire? We did, but equally, there's still no one in that club that I think fits that role in the direction that we're going. I really don't think there is. I mean, Fernandes is going to cop for it, Simon, because of his attitude. Yeah. I mean, I've got no dog in the fight to quote your good self, mate, but I was watching it yesterday and he was even annoying me. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm, I'll be clear. I, I don't like Fernandes as a footballer. I think he's a very talented footballer, but I don't like his characteristics. I don't like his outlook. I don't like a lot of the things that we saw exhibited in that moment. I try to balance it up by saying he's a good footballer, but notwithstanding it, I don't think he's a leader. I don't think he embodies what Man United will need to do to get back to where they need to get to, which is at the very top of the tree. So I think the Man United fans, well, we'll call it as they see it. But of course, you must remember in all of this, putting aside all of it, it's not the players' fault. It's not the manager's fault. It's the Glazers' fault. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the, it's not the Glazers' fault, Alex. For once, they're off the hook this morning, right? Oh, you, you never hear those words out of my mouth from the uh, <laughs> broadcast, that's for sure. Especially not with Simon on the air. But um, look, I just think we've, we're going through this habit at the moment as well. If you watch the West Ham FA Cup game, we don't play to the whistle and we're constantly moaning about decisions. We need to just do our jobs and trust the process that we're going through. But we're not there yet. We're not. Um, everyone's everyone's loving any- this, James. I've got to say to you, there's James, a Chelsea fan, United fans on Talk Sport. What a f- uh, difference a few days, mate. Uh, Alex, thanks for that. Uh, Paul's another one of many, many United fans trying to get through this morning. Paul, good morning. What do you make of all that? Uh, good morning. Um... I don't think it's anything that Ten Hag did know deep down. He must know that the squad is three to five players short and that he does dead need of a leader. There's no leaders. Bruno is not a leader. He's a decent footballer, but he's not a great. He's not a leader. So, 
Would you agree with that, Martin? He's not a leader. Do you, do you know what I'll say? All of the characteristics <clears throat> that were evident yesterday with Fernandez have been there, Jim, since he's come to the, the UK. We've known it. He sees it. I can't even look at him because it annoys the hell out of me. But I try to look at what he can do rather than the things that are really annoying <clears throat> because he has got great talent. So the decision has to be made. This new Manchester United, is he going to be a part of that? I mean, Pogba was a player that they kind of like, they had this sort of power struggle between him and Fernandes and Fernandes has sort of taken top job. He's come in, a new contract. Did they make the right call? Were either of them good enough? You know, they've got to look now, is, is that the type of player they want? They want his creativity. They want his 11 assists. They want his seven goals. But do they want those pertinent personality traits that yeah. really annoy you? But briefly, Martin, if Fernandes was a teammate of yours at full time, would you be saying something to him? I think I'd have to say to him, stop for frame and injury, stop looking for advantages. It's just it's going against us. And it, it's creating... And in neutral watching that yesterday, surely doesn't... You look at some of the could players' you reactions. Could you captain? Could you as a player... Could you, why, yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting you couldn't. I'm asking you as, an, as a player that's been in that situation. Could you say that to a captain of the team? Of course you could. A captain doesn't really have... It's not the, the same situation as a rugby union or rugby league. I think you can actually say it. And uh, it's very contrasting, isn't it? When Roy Keane must be watching that, thinking... Uh, his behaviour is so much in the opposite corner to where Roy Keane was. Mm. He wouldn't and go Steve down. Bruce before him. And, and it, so it's, that's annoying, Jim, but that's, is that the modern day player? Is that what we want? He's far from perfect. He can change. And Ten Hag has to try to change it. And if wow. he can't, he has to go. A lot of messages coming in about Fernandez specifically. There's one of them, a United fan. You cannot win titles with personalities like Bruno in the side. He's a negative influence. I'm afraid, Bruno, you're coming in for it this morning. You've joined us in the past, but this morning you're getting it in the neck. But Simon, are, are Manchester City okay? Recognised right now as the greatest side in world football. Are Manchester City now the biggest? I mean, are they now close to matching Manchester United, Liverpool, Real Madrid in worldwide iconography? If, if they're not, how close are they to achieving that? The reason I say that, the, the prize money from the Premier League, the FA Cup, Champions League, added to commercial and match day income, will see City's revenue surpassing £650 million. A Premier League record, and it sees them sustain their position as the richest football club in the world. So there we are. They've got to be the biggest, haven't they? Well, I always find this a strange phenomenon. What is the what does the richest mean? Does it mean you've got the most money? Does it mean you do the biggest turnover? Because if your if your wage bill is four hundred million quid and you're only breaking even on a turnover of six hundred and fifty million quid, does that make you the richest? No, it just means you've got the most revenue coming in. I would have thought the richest was the amount, the amount of money you're actually worth rather than the amount of money you generate. Look, Man City are well on their way to establishing themselves as a football club that people around the world will view differently than one that's just been created by Sheikh Mansour. They're on that journey, and they're building up these relationships, but they are still, to Manchester United's Ferrari, they are the Red Bull of the no, version. Not th yes, they are. No if, chance. Yes, still, they are. You can't argue that they are still. You if, can't honestly the, argue if, that they if are you, still. If you, if, you, if you look at Man United in 2018-19, didn't win the league... Did a turnover of 627 million at a time when the distributions in the in the in the Champions League were less. Didn't get to a Champions League final. Did 627 million in 2018, 19. Uh, Man City. Yeah, but that's then. This is now. But, but we're talking. If we're going to compare, we need to compare on a proper basis. If we're going to suggest that 650 million is a certain uh, criteria that we're looking at, if United did 627 million at a time when the distributions were less. There was less revenue around. Imagine what United would do if they were back on top again. If they were back winning things. In if the they were back winning. Well, this is it. Manchester City, so, five titles in six years. Yes, but we're, talk, we're, not, talking about, we're not talking about their achievements because their achievements set them apart from everybody right now. No doubt about it. Undebatable. Not even worth a discussion. Man City are the best football team in the world and their achievements are commensurate with that. Right. But we're talking about the iconography not the achievements. Yeah. And you, this, this legacy position that teams like Manchester United and to some extent Liverpool, and Real Madrid, and Barcelona, and Bayern Munich. They have a legacy about them that's very different to Man City's, and it's going to take Man City a long time to get those blue-chip credentials in the minds and eyes around the world of everybody that we're talking about. But how much longer you... do you think it's going to take? I mean, five titles generation, in six years. Generation. If they win the Champions League for the first time ever generation. on Saturday night, that's another momentous leap forward I think it's a generation I think it's I think the, 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 the challenge for Man City is that they're going to have to go through the gears to unwind the, the legacies that Liverpool and Manchester United have their achievements are eclipsing them but we don't just judge um, a football team's 
uh, uh, relationship with other people around the world simply by its achievements. We should do. We should do because their achievements are remarkable. I mean, the fact that achievements are tainted by certain uh, allegations don't help the cause. They don't help the cause. It's a matter of fact whether people like it or they don't like it. Until they clear themselves, it'll be a matter of fact. And people will make the allegation about the nature of the way that Sheikh Mansour has bought and built this team. And so, that, so we're in agreement then, they are the greatest side right now. Right are, now. Yeah. Absolutely, no doubt about it. But we're not in agreement that they are the biggest club right now. And that, you say, to become the biggest club in world football could yet take what, a generation. What do you think? I mean, it depends what you mean by biggest, doesn't it? If you mean biggest by the way that they are represented in well, the minds... The, 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 the prize do, money that they've just won has surpassed anything we've known before and has become a Premier League record. Correct. And sees them sustain their position as the richest football club in the world. So Man, United, Man City will do £650 million yeah. after winning the Premier League, getting to, all the way to a Champions League final, uh, winning the FA Cup, participating in a huge... They've United. They and, held it at and, 627 and United, million. United did £627 million, Yeah, didn't win the league... Didn't get to the Champions League final. So they've won the revenue race and now they've won the achievement race. What other races are to be run? Well, if you're looking at... you're looking at, You described it as iconography. Iconography is an almost uh, is almost an untouchable commodity where people they, it represents a certain value in people's minds. They're on that journey. There's no doubt about they're on that journey. But you've got this situation with Manchester United that goes all the way back to the Busby Babes and forward to this unique football club that can generate revenues and generate interest and have values, you wouldn't sell Manchester City. There would be nobody at the table in the world that would buy Manchester City for six billion quid. But there'd be people at the table to buy Manchester United for six billion quid because Manchester United is a blue chip brand mm. and Manchester City is not. So who's buying Manchester United? Or either... Radcliffe, yeah, or one of the Qataris, either one of them will find their deal. But no one's or, buying it for six billion. No, but they're at the, they're at the take. Well, okay, four and a half billion, then five billion. No one will buy Man City for five billion. What would you buy Man City for? What would I buy it for? What would, what would the, what would the top price be for Man, the asking price for Manchester City? I don't know. I don't know the economics of what the owners particularly want. I don't think Man United is worth five or six billion quid. But because of the because of the brand values of Man United, they're different brand values. But Ma Manchester United still have this image of aspiration still have this image mm. of this organic football club built out of power yep. and immense achievement whereas Man City has a different feel about it now that's an unfair feel because Abramovich did the same thing with Chelsea Jack Walker did the same thing with Blackburn and Newcastle would do the same thing right? when you think of Manchester City though do you think these days you call them a beautiful side do you think them are, uh, like a work of art involved the images involved like a work well, of like art the scream from it, Munch yeah because no, that's what iconography means fine I think I think that it means a lot of things to a lot of people, and in this instance, it means something to you about the size and scale of their finances. Okay. In, the, in the minds of people around the world, and Manchester United is a blue chip brand, and Man City is not. Simon, throw your weight behind this, or otherwise, UEFA set to impose a cap on lengthy contracts as they bid to to, to close what's being viewed as an FFP loophole. I mean. It's, this has really come to the fore after the practice has been used by Chelsea yeah. under Todd Bowley. Uh, signing players and contracts of up to eight and a half years to spread the impact of transfer spending. UEFA now set to, hang on, no, no, no. We're going to enforce a five-year maximum for the length of time over which a player's transfer fee can be spread with a new policy being br brought in before the next window in, in the summer. So is it a sensible move by UEFA or a restriction of trade? I think it's a restriction of trade. Really? I think the whole idea of valuing players on a straight line depreciation is not reflective of the transfer market in the first place and is fundamentally wrong anyway because ultimately players can increase and decrease in value depending upon their form. So when you just depreciate someone in a straight line, then I don't think it's right um, because effectively if you've got a player that you bought for 80 million quid and after two years he's valued on your balance sheet at 40 million quid but really he set the world on fire and he could be worth 80 million quid still I think, it, I think it artificially depreciates the balance sheet of a football club and disadvantages them I don't necessarily you know what's, what's getting around financial fair play oh I know getting sponsors that are indexed to your football club and part of your ownership model to inflate their deals to be able to give you more revenue that's more like getting around financial fair play capitalising and being prepared to have the consequences as well, of course. People just are looking at the upside. The consequence of signing a player for an eight-year deal is you add that liability for eight years of wages. So it isn't just a one-way transaction of, oh, let's see if we can get around financial fair play on transfer values. 
It also comes with a sting in its tail because you've got that person having to pay them £300,000 a week or £200,000 a week for eight years. So it comes with a yin and a yang, and I don't understand why, why FIFA would want to get involved, or UEFA in this instance, sorry, would want to get involved with telling people how they can capitalise. The transfer system is based upon people being put on someone's balance sheet over the contract term. If a football club wants to increase that contract term, who are UEFA to turn around and then say, actually, now... Because you remember when Mel Morris wanted to revalue players on a different basis? No, 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 can't do that. It's a simple policy. He's got to be depreciated over the contract term. No, 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 we don't like it now because it doesn't suit certain people that don't like the fact that people are spending a lot of money and are thinking about it commercially. So we'll change it. It makes no sense, Jim. I think right, it's a well, silly, silly change of rule. Make sense of this for me. Mudrick signed this, this week by Chelsea, or yeah. last week, whenever it was. He was at Anfield yeah. at the weekend. So he joins Chelsea in an eight-and-a-half-year deal. He does. Are you a right to raise an eyebrow to that? No, well, no, because, because it's not... What's it, thing, it's got to be because, to get round FFP. Because it's... No, it, well, listen... I've just given you the example of spreading the fee. Well, of course it is, but the economics of also spreading the liability of a player's salary over a longer period of time also hits your implications of financial fair play because you're going to have that player on on your balance sheet in four years' time with no capital value and and a big wage bill. So it cuts you another way. So why are they doing it? Well, well, hopefully we'll get a chance I, to I, I ask suspect, Todd Bully this ourselves. In, why are they doing it? Well, I suspect influential clubs don't like the dynamic of Todd Bowley coming in and trying to think creatively about what are the big assets. What's the big cost in football? The big cost in football is transfer fees and wages. OK, how do I make sense of these? How do I make sense of it? Why should I depreciate? If I'm prepared to have this player for eight years on £25 million a year wages or whatever he's on, why should I have to not be able to capitalise his value over eight years? Why shouldn't I be able to have him on? If, if the, if the right, but why eight years? Seven, six, why five? Why have UEFA suddenly decided, oh, we, we know what, we'll have you for five? What? And anyway, when they announced it last week, and, and we said eight and a half year deal, you saw the messages. Eight and a half year deal? What's we, the thinking in that? So, what is the well, thinking the clear other thi- than the clear thinking, it's a loophole? Well, the clear thinking on that is if you recruit properly, Good players stay at clubs for a long time as if you're an ambitious football club. John Terry spent his entire career at Chelsea. So with that in mind, I know he's a product of the academy, but notwithstanding it, if you buy good players in the right way with the right methodology and put the right managers in, they should stand the test of time. So, so why I mean, should it you... Gets, it gets, you know more than I do. So it gets around restrictions. It allows Chelsea to spend part, a lot more money than they might be able to And have then done. it allows Chelsea to have it up their backside somewhere along the line four years later when they were just paying wages... Uh, with a player that's massively depreciated, so it cuts both ways. I mean, how long is Mudrick going to be at Chelsea? Well, it also puts Chelsea in control of a situation. If this player, after three years, is killing it, right? then Madrid come along and go, uh, uh, we fancy him, he's got a lead in his contract. They don't have that situation anymore. Chelsea are now in control of that player's registration for eight years. Why would the player sign an eight-year contract? Think about the player. The player. So why aren't the PFA popped up? Why aren't they saying, because they've got lots to say for themselves about nothing, why aren't they turning around and saying, we think this is great, this is giving top professional security of contract? Why aren't they popping up with their two penneth? Because that's the other side of the argument. I don't believe this is right. Would you? You don't believe it's right? No, I believe it's absolutely right. You should put a player on a contract and they should depreciate over the contract you're prepared to give them. The rules are... So you, are, you would do what Bully's doing? Damn straight I would if I was in a situation where I was buying players that were good enough to put on eight-year contracts. So what do you make of this then? Speaking about uh, transition periods on Michael Calvin's Football People podcast, Jurgen Klopp had a real swipe at Chelsea. There are obviously plenty of ways, different ways you can do it, but it's all based on the situation you are in, and um, especially with the things happening around Chelsea with new ownership, obviously. <laughs> Nobody knows exactly now how they do it, how they can spend that much money, stuff like this, other teams. So nobody likes me talking about that because it's, uh, it's, it's okay you talk about it, but a transition needs time usually if you don't have endless money. So otherwise you can change overnight pretty much and you bring in 10 players and, other ten, and, and if you wouldn't. Last week I got a question about if I'm too loyal. <laughs> I really think it's a, that's a... I'm not too loyal, but questioning loyalty in general is a sign of our time, uh, the time we are living in as well, so which I really don't like too much. What a lot of old contradictory crap. If you turn around <laughs> to a manager and said, I'm going to give you 10 players now, the first thing the media will say is, oh, too many players, can't build a team overnight, they've got to gel together. Now he's saying, oh, I, I could change a team overnight by bringing in 10 players. Make your minds up, riddle me this, riddle me that. Whatever you haven't got is the reasons why you complain about something else. There is nothing, the rules allow Chelsea, the, 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 re, the regulations are very simple. You can depreciate a player over his contract length. If you want to sign a player for eight years, why would they change the rules? What, because other people don't like it? Is that how it works then? 
Other people don't like the rules because they think that someone's gaming the system. But is it not quite simple? It allows people, in this case, Bully at Chelsea, but you're not to listening. spend a lot of money at once. But you're not listening because it allows people to have bigger liabilities further down the line. It'll catch up with Chelsea at some point. But it's a risk they're willing to take. Because well, Chelsea are going to take a, a player on a contract and commit themselves to, let's say this kid's on 200 grand a week, they're going to commit themselves to £18 million pounds of wages when in previous incarnations they'd only commit themselves to 40. If he turns out to be a stinker, like the fellow at Arsenal, Pepe, right, what are you going to do then? You've now got it for eight years wrapped around you. Would that be as clever? So if Chelsea are prepared to run their business that way, why change the rules? Because a few people think, hang on a second, they're gaming the system. Mm. No, they're following the rules. And they're following it based upon contract depreciation. And I think it's an absolute outrage. This industry is almost already immature enough about how it values players. You once said to Mel Morris in this studio, what you're doing is cute. Is this cute? It's cute because Mel was bending the rules. Is this cute? Um, is it cute? No, it's thinking its way... Th- it's, <laughs> it's cute. It, no, you almost no, agree no, no, with me. It's thinking its way through the conundrum of spending... First and foremost, the transfer market is ridiculous. If we've got to pay these outrageous amounts of monies for these little Herberts to kick a ball around at £100 million pound like Jack Grealish, right? Then then you shouldn't <laughs> have to depreciate them that way. God, but it is. Was, I'm right. It was, it they're not worth to be brought quid. into it at some stage, weren't they? <laughs> oh, yeah, they're not worth God. 100 million quid. So if we've got to pay these inflated transfer market prices to be able to sustain football, then surely to God these football clubs should be able to capitalise these players on whatever damn contract they feel like putting them on. See, I knew you'd go with the clubs. I knew you'd go with the in this at instance. The top no, of the clubs. no, I, I don't like. Listen, I don't like 450 million quid being spent in two transfer markets by one football club. I well, think that's what we're getting. That's what we're asking. Right, but the fact of the matter is, the argument is, is that Chelsea are prepared to take that business model in the same way that. Manchester City, Newcastle, PSG, and people have done before, and try and fold it down into an economic model that complies with the rules. Mm. They're not trying to get sponsorship from their own in-house sponsors and inflate it like some people have done. Who would that be? I don't know. Maybe we can have a think about that in the break. You can never resist having a swipe at a player kind of like Nicholas Pepe got it there. But he was useless. Jack got it there. I mean, he's not useless, but, you know. Hi, good morning. Yeah, it's... uh... It's pretty frightening, to be fair, but I really don't think we're getting a a fair shake of the stick. I mean, um, one of the charges is related to an alleged payment to Roberto Mancini. Uh, Chelsea, who got in uh, before FFP, five years before us, and then started pulling up the drawbridge, they spent £160 sacking managers, but we're not allowed to pay our manager a little bit extra because we're not allowed to spend money that has been uh, put into the club, just like Roman Abramovich did. That doesn't make any sense, Joe. That's not the allegation that's being made against you. What about her? He isn't an answer. They've they've paid managers off. And what you are being alleged is you had a parallel contract. You had Mancini being paid for by Man City and then another contract that was part of his contract with Man City but wasn't being featured on their balance sheet being paid somewhere else. That's a completely different discussion. Well, it's not a different discussion because if... Please. If, well, well, it's not because if FFP wasn't so stringent unnecessarily, we wouldn't need to give out... Well, OK, it would but, but, but the, if you, if, not liking the rules isn't an argument. The rules are the rules. You don't like the rules? Tough. What's that got to do with the price of cheese? Well, it's got everything to do with it. Because no, it, it hasn't. They're the rules. Well it, well, it, well, it has because it shows how everything is a cartel. The Premier League would love it if they had four teams competing for the title every single year and everyone else just has to suck it. Well, that's a ridiculous observation. Why why do you think that? Because, well, look at the formation of the Super League. You've got historic teams who've been much more successful in the past, who didn't have the money, they were running up huge amounts of debt, and they were going to get all these billions from the Super League. Of course, City were invited into it. But it's always been well, like they are then. Yeah, but Joe, I think I think the Premier League loved it when when Leicester City broke the mold and 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 won the league on that day. Anyway, we're going we're going off the the topic really. But it makes do, it, do but you it, think Joe, you, you're due answers from your own football club? Um. Well, I mean, look, it'd be great to know what's going on. Well, the answer is or... yes, isn't it? The answer is yes. It's not a qualified no or maybe. The bottom line is you don't like the rules. You think the rules are weighted against you. You talk about Chelsea firing managers and paying off 160 million quid, which has got nothing to do with the price of cheese. You're being uh, you're being alleged that you have misrepresented sponsorships. You have misrepresented the the contracts that players and managers have been on. And you know what? That's really easy to prove if you haven't done it. Why do sponsorships come into it? Like, oh, great, United what, have got what, a track. Shall I tell you why? Spon- yeah, shall and- I tell you why? Because yeah, because it. the main sponsors that you were using were indexed to the ownership of the club and the fair value of a market price, which is assessed by independent commissions that have nothing to do with vested interest, 
looked at those and went, that's an inflated commercial sponsorship deal to overcome a challenge. That's why it's relevant. Well, it's not relevant because if... Well, not to you, it's not because you don't like it. Well, if we were allowed to spend the money that we were... But that's not how it works. You can't just do what you want. There's a financial fair play regulation in place for a reason. You might not like it, yeah, and you reason, might suggest other people yeah, need to get caught in it as well. The historic, club, uh, the historic club's at the top, right? How Harry Maguire's inflated. The guy's awful. That, you know, that, that's not, that, hang on a second. That's a transfer which you capitalise on your balance sheet. This is something very different. You've got a, you've got a partner or a, a business that your owners own sponsoring the football club and sponsoring it at a price that's not reflective of market value for every other sponsorship deal around the world. And Man City, by the way, don't have the same intrinsic value for sponsorship than that some of the other bigger football clubs that have more legacy relationships around the world. So your argument is just, I don't like it because it's Man City. That's your argument. Well, well, Joe, if we finish with this, City say they look forward to this matter being put to rest once and for all. Do you think it will be? I hope so. And... You know, if we are exonerated like we were through CAS... No, you weren't. Look- you weren't exonerated. You got a £10 million fine and you, were, and you got around it by time bars. You weren't exonerated. You'll hear Ten Hag now on why Sancho was dropped from the squad. This was him. Jaden was um, on his performance on the training. We didn't select him. You have to reach a, a level every day on Manchester United and we can make choices in the front line. Um, yeah. And so for this game, he wasn't selected. So that's Ten Hag, Stuart, saying why there was no Jaden Sancho yesterday. Ten Hag then goes on social media and says, uh, sorry, Jaden Sancho goes on social media and says, don't believe everything you read. Uh, I will not allow people saying things that are completely untrue. He says he's conducted himself very well in training this week. He respects all the decisions that are made by the coaching staff. Um, he says, I'll continue to fight for this badge no matter what. That was Jadon Sancho. But something's mm. wrong here, isn't it? You would think so. The one thing surprised me that he didn't leave the club in, in the last transfer window. I thought he'd have been on his way. Um, quite often when a manager and player sort of fall out, I always err on probably the manager because the manager probably sees things from everyone's perspective. The player sees things from their own perspective. And if he thinks that the player's not hit the standards he should have done, then there's only one person picks the team, the manager. But Are you, that, you've been a manager though, Stuart. Yes, would, I you, have. would you call him out in a presser like Ten Hag did? Well, you're going to get asked a question. I'm sure he didn't offer it up. He got asked the question, where's Sancho? So yes, you've but, got to answer but, it and but, be uh, as honest as you can. The general principle it. of managers criticising players in the media is frowned upon by by the football fraternity. I don't think there's a problem with it. I think that it's character building at times. So you've got to use it when you need to use it. But you, do you have an issue? Because one thing, him choosing to answer a question, if someone asks you an answer in a press conference why the player isn't playing, you can just simply give an answer that's nondescript and move on. You don't have to be specific and explicit like he's been. He's chosen to be so. So if that's the case, do you are you, do you, are you you happy with him suggesting to the rest of the world that the player's training isn't up to the standard that he should be? Simon, the other side of that is potential bending the truth or lying as a manager. And and I know sometimes you've got to be protective to yourself, to your football trade, club and to the player. No, I don't think so. Not well, for everyone it is. It come isn't. on, it is. Ultimately, you know, you manipulate the truth to be able to manage the circumstances because you have to spend your entire life prostituting yourself well, to manage the players. Put it this way. He could have turned around and said he's got a slight niggle. You're lying. Yeah, well, he's volunteering information. It, 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 ultimately, you're lying if someone says, well, I've heard he hasn't got a niggle. Yeah. So what do you say to that? Listen, and then you're lying. All the time, you cannot... And you've got an ulterior motive on occasion as a manager. Sometimes you protect the players. Sometimes you turn around and say, he's not been up to standard in training. And those words, hopefully, arrive at But what at is the Sancho. purpose of that? Because ultimately, that's, that's a very easy conversation to say to the player. Which they've had. In your relationship with the player, ultimately, the player's going to respond to you and you alone. If that's, going to be, yeah. if that's a mechanism you need to deploy as a manager. right? So you have this conversation. And then you decide which, by the way, I'm in favour of, you decide that you're going to put it into the media. Mm. You're going to bring the world's attention onto it. So now you've orchestrated a situation with players in this modern era where they're islands in their own right economically. So yep. they won't put up with this. Yep. I think that's wrong as well. I think they've got to learn to take their own medicine at times. And you've now created a situation where the media now have got a manager turning around and saying that the player isn't training properly. The player rebuts that, accuses the manager of making him a scapegoat, 
and you have a situation that has, seems to have a zero-sum game in it for anybody. Mm. Well, the bottom line is he's not getting much out of Sancho and hasn't done for the last year. So what's he got to lose? Mm. Mm. It's a shame he didn't start trotting this out, though, Simon. At Manchester City, Sancho's future there was in doubt. He failed to turn up for training on several occasions. Um, following Guardiola's decision to leave him out the club's pre-season tour of the US at Dortmund he was dropped he was fined 86 grand by Dortmund yeah. after arriving late back from international duty Sancho was quoted in the Telegraph uh, saying in Germany there are a few things I need to work on little things where I need to be a bit more professional slowly but surely as I get older I feel like I'm learning new things he turned up late for Southgate in England let's not dispute the versions of events that the manager's given. Let's 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 analyse the reasons why he's given them to the media, and then why the player has bitten back rather than accept it. Because ultimately, it's not about whether your Ten Hag is lying or whether Jaden Sancho is a model professional. Because as you quite rightly have done, you've just been able to prove a body of work that suggests that ultimately there's form for this. And of course, you've got a player that's played 50, 60 games for Manchester United and hardly set the heather on fire. And there's people questioning his ability and people are now looking at what Manchester United have bought at 75 million quid and so they bought a pup. This is the same player that Ten Hag sent out to Holland last year to get his mind right and had that enough investment in him to actually send him to a place that Ten Hag has come from to be able to get this player into the right position. I don't understand why it's the case. The bigger question is, is what is the purpose of Jadon Sancho coming back and making the observations that he's made? That's right. When it's very, very easy... Well, right of reply. Well, right of reply, you know, again, you know, everyone's got the right of reply, but if you open your mouth and you say something ridiculous, what's the benefit of that? Yeah, but if and Ten Hag was... went public, shouldn't but Jadon Sancho But the ultimate public? authority in, in the club, in the football operation, is the manager. And that, by, by, by Jadon Sancho coming back and saying something, I think it goes to the credibility of the manager's control over his players and the culture in Man United at this moment in time where there's no acceptance of their own responsibilities. Is there any way back throw... for Sancho? Yes, there's always a way back for footballers. Always. But the manager might turn around and say, look, I've gone out on a limb with Ronaldo and, and put him out the team and out the football club, basically. And big call from the manager. As Simon said there, he's back Sancho. He's tried to help Sancho last year. And sometimes as an individual and as a manager, because I've sat in that seat before, you think, I've gone out my way to help you. And all of a sudden... You've come back in and he's not happy with what he's seen in training, so he's left him out. You feel let down and disappointed, by the way, and sometimes you get a bit of frustration off yourself and think, I'm not going to back you up anymore. And by the way, this example... Right, so he was right, Ten Hag was right to say it? Oh, I think so. Well, yeah, I mean, if, that, if, 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 if he's right to say it if he knows what the outcome's going to be. It's really easy to go around flinging around authority and anyone can give someone a telling off. But if you don't know what the reaction's going to be, what's the point of it in the first place? You need to be doing it to get a reaction. If the reaction is you get a player biting back and saying what he said in the media, then I'm not entirely sure what you've achieved. Yes. And I'm not entirely sure that the example was put up by Alex Crook yesterday about Marcus Rashford responding to it was a particular uh, poster boy moment because it took Marcus Rashford months to get himself together. He spent months in a difficult state of mind, in a petulant state of mind. And it may have well been that Ralph Ranjek was not the perfect coach. But it took him a long time to get the penny to drop yeah. about where his performances were against where his attitude was. I think with Jadon Sancho, he's not a Manchester United player. He's not good enough to play for Manchester United. And that's the underlying problem. And what you're trying to do is square, squeeze a round peg into a square hole. The best thing they can do is recognise the fact that the player isn't good enough at this level and move him on. I put it out there, actually, to Manchester United fans who are calling in in numbers <clears throat> on Jadon Sancho. Was he due a right of reply or was that foolish on his part to answer back to what Ten Hag said post-match at the Emirates yesterday? And is he good for Man Is he good enough for Manchester United? In your eyes, has this guy not been given long enough? 03717-223344-81089. And Michael is a big Manchester United fan. Michael, good morning to you. What do you want to say on Sancho? How are you doing, boys? I just think Sancho is a, he's not a Ten Hag signing. We've got to remember that. And he may not just be the makeup of the player that he wants. He's a, he was an Ole Gunnar Solskjaer signing, was it? And I feel like Anthony plays every game and he may not even warrant a, a, a place in the team sometimes. But Ten Hag sees him in training every day. He knows that he does more than just assist and score goals. It's just a small part. But Sancho, for me, he's not really got the pace what Rashford and Anthony offer in those quick attacks he wants. But I feel like we've got to give Ten Hag the time to make that squad his own. He's still got three managers worth of players in it, I think. 
uh, from before. Um, I do think that with Sancho coming out, some people don't react well to um, to criticism, and I feel like that's the younger generation. I'm like forty something now, so but I do get like the younger generation. They're not into the criticism like the older players used to be. Yeah. Or they can't, they can't just get on with it. It's just not, it's just a different makeup, and it's fine to say, "Oh well, just get on with it." You're paying lots of money, but it does affect people more than other people. But I just think he isn't a Ten Hag signing. Uh, Michael, listen, thanks for the call. Is it a generational thing, Stuart? I mean, you were saying earlier on that you go out on the pitch and try and be man of the match every single time you played. I wonder if there's the same attitude here. That, I mean, what, what's his attitude when he goes in the field of play? Um, of course, it's a generational thing that has changed, but you, you've got to know the individual. If you're managing the individual, you've got to know what motivates those individuals. And, and we're all different with our levels of motivation, you yeah. know? And as Simon made a good point, you've got to have an outcome to everything that you do. I think probably with Ten Hag, this was based on a little bit of frustration. <clears throat> we've done what we can for you and still you've let me down. But it's a societal eyes. thing as well, Jim. People don't... It's a one-way transaction. I mean, half these footballers should actually be boxers because the boxers have got the thin, thinnest skin. You can't dare criticise any of them. You've got to get the fairness. If, if the criticism is fair... Then, then criticism is as equally valuable as praise. If the only thing you can ever have in your life is praise, then you're going to go so far because when it comes to adversity, you're not going to be prepared for it. So I think, I think it's, a, it's a societal thing. You can't say anything about anybody in this day and age without somebody being offended by it. And I think that part of the manager's repertoire is fair criticism to try and enhance the player's performance or to concentrate the player's mind. Now, whether you do that in a public domain because you've reached the end of the road and you think, oh, I've tried every single lever, yeah. I've done everything I possibly can, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull you into the public domain and I'm going to name and shame you for your performances. Now, if that's the lever that he wants to pull... Then okay, and if there's going to be a re- and if that reaction, if he's happy with the reaction, he may well turn around in the next press conference and say, "I like that." He may spin it around and say, "I like the player's got some 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 substance to push back on my observation." I don't think he will have liked the player's observations. I think he'd prefer the player to have come into his office and said, well, "I didn't like what you said, boss," but ultimately, I'll get my I'll get my head down and get on with whatever it is you want me to get on with. But I, I think it's just a case of we live in a society now where anybody that suggests that something you're doing isn't good enough is someone that's being unfair, they have an agenda, or, 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 or they're just being bloody rude, when most of the time it's somebody saying, let's call it for what it is. Yeah, yeah. Jermaine, do you agree with Simon on that? Another United fan. That... Oh, well, I've looked at it in a different perspective. I, I totally understand in terms of the Santo responding, which was r- wrong in that case. But Tim Hark didn't need to come out and say anything at all. He's got Anthony. He's spent 82 million. What has he done? He's like a defensive winger. You might as well move on, but second play, more than the right wing. I just don't understand what Tenag is trying to do at this moment in time because he's spent that, all that money on the goalkeeper. Yeah, he can pass the ball six judge yards and he can move you from the back, but what is Manchester United's playing style? What, what, okay, what Jermaine, playing? listen, thanks for that. There's Sam and Hyde, big Manchester United fan, Stuart. Sancho, quite simply, listen to Simon. Sa- Sancho's not good enough. He's let every manager down with the level of his performances. He's static when he comes on. He's a couple of good games, thinks he's cracked it, then goes back the way. For me, I'm I'm seeing a kid there going back a few years when he was winning things with the England team and whatever, and I was hoping he would have a great future, you know, that's going to be a, a consistent in the England squad at senior level. And I've just not seen it at the moment. And if managers are criticising him... Somewhere down the line, he can't keep ticking along in his career and get to the end of his career and all of a sudden look back and say, you know what, I've not really maximised here. Yes, yeah, which would be a a tragic set of circumstances. Jim White and Simon Jordan. Monday to Friday mornings from 10 on AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.